Good evening, folks, and a hearty welcome to our drive-in theater. We have a wonderful evening's entertainment lined up for you, one that will provide several hours of pleasurable relaxation and diversion for you and your family. Did you fail to dress up for tonight's show? No tie, an old shirt and slacks, a house dress? Well, don't give it a thought. We're glad you came as you are. We just want you to enjoy yourselves. Don't forget to visit our refreshment center during the intermission or any time. You love the tasty array of snacks we have to offer. So will the youngsters. Everything is quality and mm -hmm, so good. We hope you'll make this a weekly visit. Bring the family. Bring your friends. There are always wonderful new pictures to see, delightful snacks to nibble, a gay, pleasant evening for all. Oh, a word of caution. Don't drive over 10 miles an hour in the theater area for your safety's sake. And mom or pop, go with the kids when they leave the car. We hope you have a wonderful time. Come back soon. of the Central Bureau in Washington, D.C., there was a story so strange in its implications that it defies ordinary classifications. Time, 719. An unidentified object was picked up 200 miles southwest of Point Barrow, Alaska. Height, 75,000 feet. Estimated speed, 5,000 miles per hour. White warning. 754. First interceptor flight airborne. Point of interception, 80 miles due west of San Francisco, California. 7.55, unidentified object past point of interception, red warning. This is the account of a handful of people who in the course of one desperate night fought off an unknown, unseen menace from another world. Doubly terrifying because it was invisible. set to destroy the earth. The human race lulled into a false sense of security except for one scientist who dared probe the secret of this terrifying plan. They're here, they're here, they're going to destroy us. It's all right, Dr. Martin, you're with friends. You'll be all right. They'll kill everyone we've got to stop now! Easy, Doug, easy. Who are you? A scientist, like yourself. Where do you come from? From a planet, yet unknown to you. I'm getting out of here. Stay where you are. Oh. Dr. Martin. What are you doing with this? Kill him. Go on, get back. Do as he says. You'll see an amazing succession of staggering scenes. Strange monsters, giant reptiles, and astounding marvels of science yet unborn.
This is Washington, D.C. And in the files of the Central Bureau, there is a story so strange in its implications that it defies ordinary classification. It is the story of a handful of people who in the course of one desperate night held back a wave of panic and pandemonium. It began after sundown, time 7.15, as Flight A, Coast Patrol from Travis Field was returning to base. When the nightly Air Force transport pointed north toward Japan via the Great Circle route. While at sea, the Navy and Coast Guard maintained their usual round-the-clock vigil. And from the equator to the Arctic, the radar network swept the skies with eyes that never sleep. Time, 719. An unidentified object was picked up 200 miles southwest of Point Barrow, Alaska. 727. Unidentified object confirmed at Fairbanks, Alaska. Heading south, southeast, 170 degrees. Height, 75,000 feet. Estimated speed, 5,000 miles per hour. White warning. 739. Unidentified object, 200 miles due west of Vancouver, British Columbia. Course, 170 degrees. Height, 60,000 feet. Estimated speed, down to 3,600 miles per hour. Yellow warning. 7.54. First interceptor flight airborne. Point of interception, 80 miles due west of San Francisco, California. 7.55, unidentified object past point of interception. Red warning. 8.11, Morro Bay, California. Height, 50,000 feet. Estimated speed, 2,000 miles per hour. 8.15, Santa Monica, California. Height, 10,000 feet, speed 1,200 miles per hour. 818, all traces of unidentified objects gone. Red warning lifted. By 825 at the Los Angeles branch of the Communications Commission, reports of strong interference with radio and television reception began to pour in from the beach area. The monitors went to work immediately. Mobile units were ordered to converge on the vicinity of the disturbance. Pinpoint direction finding devices began to trace the trouble to its source. This is Mobile One, Hazen speaking. Uh, we're at Ocean and Beacon Way, interference strength two, uh, bearing 27 degrees. Over. Mobile one from center. Roger. Over. Mobile center from Mobile seven. Over. Go ahead, Mobile seven. This is Mobile seven. For the Pacific center in beach four. Interference strength three, bearing 39 degrees. Over. This is Mobile center. Roger. Stand by. Mobile one and Mobile seven. From Mobile center, point of interception estimated three miles north of surf. Repeat, three miles north of surf. Acknowledge. This is Mobile 7, Roger. Mobile 1, Roger. Mobile 7, Roger, we'll go out. Okay, Charlie, let's get moving. Yes, what is it? Take me to a phone quick, I need an ambulance. What's the matter? My husband and Pete out there in the picnic grounds just above the beach, they've been hurt. Well, this is a communications car. I'll phone it in from here. I'm over one to Central, over. Did you make that out, Charlie? Not a word. I'm over one to Central, I can't reach you, repeat. Well, they must be getting us all right. I'm over one to Central, 
Have an ambulance sent to beach at surf. Emergency, two men heard. Acknowledge. Roger and out. I'm sure they'll be here soon now. Tell us what happened. Oh, this man, he just kept coming at us. It was awful. Who? I don't know. He was wearing a suit like a diver. Hurry, please. They're hurt. Charlie, you better wait here. I'll go down and take a look. The young woman's hysteria became obvious as they reached the picnic grounds at the beach. There was no sign of the mysterious intruder, and little could be done for her husband and their friend until the ambulance arrived. How are you doing? Oh, we're just taking another reading now. What happened down there? The police took the girl and one of the guys to the station. What about the other one? Well, he's on the way to the morgue. That was her husband. You're right on the button, Charlie. 44.7. Report back to Central if you find anything else. Charlie, grab that portable and check the beach, will you? Got it right here. I'll pick you up right here in about an hour. Where are you going? Police asked me to drop by the station and sign a report. I'll see you later. If you don't, you know where to look for the body. Like I said, we were just starting to eat when we heard something tracking through the sand toward us. I looked up and couldn't see anything. Then Betty screamed. At what? I thought you couldn't see anything. At first we couldn't. Then this, this guy started toward us. What kind of a guy? How should I know? He was wearing some kind of a helmet over his head. He could have been a deep sea diver or anything. All right. After you saw this, this diver, what happened? Well, we jumped up. Ed, that was Betty's husband, he yelled at him to stop. But he just kept coming. I never saw anything like it. He didn't say anything. He just kept moving in. And then you say he attacked you. Well, we didn't give him a chance. Ed grabbed a piece of wood and took a swing at him. That didn't stop him. He caught the end. That's, that's all I remember. Just because a man's taken a walk, there's no reason to slug him. Besides, you don't look like a guy who frightened so easy. How would you feel if somebody with a crazy helmet with pipes sticking out of it came at you in the dark? And look, I know this sounds, sounds crazy, but there wasn't any head in that helmet. No head. No head at all. It's the truth. I think you need some coffee. I don't want anything. It's all the same to you, Lieutenant. I've got to pick up one of my men at the beach. Okay, thanks for coming down, Hazen. Hope I didn't put you out. No trouble, so long. You too. All right, let's start at the beginning. How well did you know the dead man? And his wife? Betty and I went to school together. I knew Ed a year. How long were they married? About a year. Wasn't her husband a little older than she? I don't know. You said you and Mrs. Evans went to school together. Then you never discussed anything personal with her? She did mention he was older, yes. How much? Fifteen, twenty years. What difference does that make? That wasn't too hard now, was it? Where do you live? 629 and a half East Palm Court. Why? That's where the Evans live, isn't it? Yeah, I board with them. You do, huh? Now, Mrs. Evans is a good-looking woman. What are you trying to say? Lieutenant Bowers. Where? Yeah, I got it. I'll leave right away. You've been in a murder. Near the beach. Keep an eye on this guy until I get back. Where are you? You'll stay right where you are. At least until Mrs. Evans feels well enough to talk. What do you want from her? Oh, I just want to see if your story checks with hers. After all, you went to school together, remember? You say there were no witnesses, huh? None yet. Anything missing? I don't think so. The cash register wasn't touched. Get a breakdown of the inventory as soon as you can. What about fingerprints? The boys are working on them now.
sorry I'm late. What kept you so long? The lieutenant asked me to hang around a while. Well, what's the score? Eh, it looks like one of those things. Pretty girl, older husband, young boarder. Kid claims some guy without a head knocked the old man off. Yeah, don't say. Anything else? Yeah, he had a diver's outfit with horns. No, he's going to have to do better than that. How are we doing? I took a reading about ten minutes ago. The radiation has gone out with the tide. What about the radio phone? It's working fine again. I just got a call from Central. They said Mobile 7 picked up some new trouble northeast of here. Here we go again. Hop in. Who reported this murder? There he is there. He lives next door. His name's George Nelson. Hey, Mr. Nelson. Yes, sir. Come here, will you? I'm Lieutenant Bowers, homicide. You found this buddy? That's right. He must have just locked up for the night when this happened. How do you know that? Well, he usually does around this time. What were you doing here? I was sitting home watching the fights on TV, and all of a sudden the things start acting up. What has that got to do with it? Well, you don't know the set. You know, it wouldn't work at all when I came home to supper. Then all of a sudden it cleared up fine. So I thought, well, I'll get set to look at the fights again, and all of a sudden out it goes again. So I thought maybe the battery station down here was overcharged the circuit, and so I came down to take a look. That's all. Hey, don't you ever quit work? What's up this time? Another murder? What are you doing here, Hazen? Same as before. Still trying to track down that signal in the field. Hey, uh, does that stuff work on TV, too? Well, it has been for hours. What'd I tell you? What's the matter? Seems to set one on the blink. Well, at least we know we're on the right track. How'd you make out with that border? <laughs> You're still sticking to a story. The guy had no head. Well, I'll be seeing it. So long. Right. Watch out. And so the communications team resumed its mission to track the mysterious interference to its source. By accurate readings taken at regular intervals by stationary and mobile units, it was determined that the disturbance was moving in a northeasterly direction. By 1034, Mobile Center had pinpointed the disturbance at the edge of the Huntington oil fields. Units 1 and 7 were instructed to close in. Hey, Charlie, do you see what I see? Yeah, the oil field. Let's hope our trouble's burning up. Well, there's only one way to find out. Look, Sarge. Two murders and an explosion in one precinct is big news. Now, come on, you can't pin it all on the young border. Or can you? Very funny. Yeah? I'm Hazen of the Communications Commission. Oh, the lieutenant's waiting for you. Thank you. There's a wheel. You heard the man, Communications Commission. So we just kind of uh, interference happened very often. Never anything like this. It's on the move all the time. You mean some ham with a transmitter in the car? It's not a transmitter. We don't get a definite disturbance, just, just interference. Mm. Then you have no idea of what it is, huh? Not yet. How are you making up? Not so good. You were here when I questioned that boy about the murder at the beach. Did you get anything more out of it? Yeah. Come on with me. You might want to see this. Ah, I see you're just about done. Thanks. You can go now. Are you sure this is what the man looks like? What do you say, Betty? Well, just about, only I think the tubes were a little lower down. And you still insist there was no head inside the helmet? I'm positive there wasn't. What about you? Well, it was dark. I couldn't swear to it. Thanks, that'll be all. You mean we can go now? Yeah, for the time being. Just stick close to home, I may want to see you again tomorrow. We'll be there. Come on, Benny. Kind of changed your mind about those two, haven't you? Yeah, I guess I have. Hey, look, bring in the old man, will you? 
Oh, tell me, you believe this story about this, this whatever it is. <laughs> I know, it sounds as phony as it ever did. But, oh, sit down, will you please? You're the, uh, watchman at the Huntington Oil Fields? Oh, yes, sir. I've been with the company for over 22 years, sir. Yeah. Will you tell Mr. Hazen here exactly what happened? Well, sir, like I said before, I was just closing the gate for the night when I saw this fellow coming up. I was never so scared in my life. Yes, go on. Well, it wasn't the man so much as the suit he was wearing. Well, he wouldn't stop when I hollered at him. He just pushed his way right in there through the gate and, and walked right up to the tank. Now, you carry a gun? Did you try to stop him? Oh, well, he was much too close to the tank. I was afraid to shoot. So I thought I might call for help. And just to got to the shack, the tank blew up. Oh, you should see this sign. Yeah, that, uh, uh, sir, can you give us a description of this man? How would you say he was dressed? Well, sir, like I said before, he wore a sort of a, a sort of flyers, uh, not outfit with a helmet attached to it. How tall was he? Oh, he was a giant of a man. A and he had tubes sticking out of that thing, that helmet he wore. Uh, can you tell us what his face looked like? Huh. Well, sir, though you got pretty close to me, I could swear the man had no face. Now, if you saw this man again, would you recognize him? I mean, by his outfit. Oh, I'll never forget that sight if I live to be a hundred, sir. Would you say this is the man? Wait, sure, that, that's him. Yeah, thank huh? you very much. You may go now. All right, sir. Thank you. Well, Hazen, what do you say now? Beats me. The descriptions check all right. This could be some kind of flying suit. High altitude equipment. Yeah, that's what I've been thinking. Well, how do you explain that stuff about the missing head? No, we can discount that. These people were frightened. This night, nobody really took a close look at it. I guess you're right. But whoever he is, that outfit doesn't look like one of ours. Of course. He could have been dropped by parachute. You mean sabotage? I think we'd better wire a report to Washington, see what they say. All right, you can use our teletype. I'll tip off the only place to please to be on the lookout for something unusual. Hey, wait a minute. What about the press? Oh, I don't think they know too much now. You better keep it that way for a while at least, till we find out whether our friend is still around here. Well, if he is, I think we can find him for you. My hunch is that he's, he's carrying something around that's causing all this disturbance, whether he knows it or not. Yeah. Kill that page one lead. They let the border and the girl go. Hmm? How do I know? Maybe the lieutenant thinks that the guy in a flying suit knocked off the husband. Mm-hmm. Nah. No, no, not a chance. Not a chance of uh, an exclusive on that picture. They're making a blanket release in the morning. Hmm? Oh, there's a guy from the Communications Commission in there now. Yeah, I'll call you back later if there's anything new. Okay. Come in. Sorry to interrupt you, Lieutenant. Yo, what is it, Jim? There's a teletype cam for you. Oh, thanks, Jim. We're waiting for it. That was fast. Well, here's our answer. Looks like they never sleep in Washington. Says to contact a Major Andrews, care of Dr. Wyatt, Director of the Griffith Institute. Hey, it's kind of late. Man, I'll give him a call. Well, you're right. I'll go out the car and check in with Central. Okay. Well, that's the story up till now. We got in touch with Washington. They told us to contact you here. Hmm. Very interesting. What do you think, Doctor? When I see something like this, I understand why you gentlemen might have thought sabotage was involved. Lieutenant, are you sure there were no traces of this saboteur, this X-man, found after the explosion in the oil field? The fire department went over every inch of the area. Didn't come up with a thing. Well, then there's a strong possibility that he might have perished in the explosion itself. I doubt that. We're pretty well convinced this man is carrying something that it's responsible for all the signal interference. According to the last report I got, there was a definite disturbance about three miles east of the oil fields, sometime after the explosion. Well, then, if he's alive, you should be able to keep an accurate check of his whereabouts. Not that easy. As a matter of fact, we lost contact about three quarters of an hour ago. Maybe he realized you were trailing him and got rid of whatever he had that was causing the disturbance. In that case, there's nothing much my department can do to help you. I guess it's up to us. Unless you have some suggestions. Well, 
Let me think out loud for a minute. It might just be that what we've been talking about so far, and this phantom, as we'll call him, ties in with what the doctor and I have been discussing. That is very possible. I don't know whether you know it or not, but somewhere around 7.30 this evening, our radar networks picked up an unidentified object off Point Barrow, Alaska. They traced it clear down to Santa Monica before they lost it. Santa Monica? That's where we first picked up our radio interference. Yeah, right at the scene of the murder. Well then, if all these things tally up, we've got some idea of how our man got here. You mean that he came in some plane? In that case, somebody would have seen it land and take off again. Or did it crash? No. No, we don't think it was a plane. No rocket or jet that has been built so far can attain the speeds of 5,000 miles an hour, particularly for such a great distance. And maybe we're on the wrong track altogether. Couldn't your unidentified object have been a meteor? They travel at a terrific speed. Yes, fast enough for most of them to burn themselves out the moment they hit the Earth's atmosphere. And did it occur to you that meteors are not very likely to travel horizontally? all the way from the North Pole to California? Well, if it wasn't a meteor, or a flying missile of some type, how do you figure this phantom ties in? We're not sure that he does. I don't care what you say, but it doesn't make sense to me. Anybody trained in sabotage would say undercover, this guy's walking around in a monkey suit, killing people. Excuse me, Dr. Wyatt. Is there a Lieutenant Bowers in here? Oh, uh, yes. What is it, miss? There's a Mr. Wakeman from the Chronicle here to see you. Wakeman here? Now, what does he want? Well, there's only one way to find out. Before you go, Lieutenant, I don't believe you have met my assistant, Barbara Randall. Well, hello. Hello. It's Mrs. Randall, Lieutenant. I'll be right back. Barbara? You know the Major? Of course. And this is Mr. Hayden of the Communications Commission. How do you do? Well, I see you are working a little later tonight than usual. Yes, my husband's teaching a late class and he won't be able to pick me up for a while. Besides, I had some work to do in the lab. Well, at least you'll have lots of company. All right. So I shouldn't have come up here. But I've got to get you a wrangle on this beach murder. And your whole department is shut up. Look, Wakeman, will you stop bothering me? There's nothing to say. If you got an exclusive story from that Evans Damon or Bohr, then you know as much as I do. Yeah, but that does, still doesn't explain anything about the guy without a head. Come on, who is he? Your guess is as good as mine. You mean you let those two kids go without knowing that? I don't buy it. Well, I did. Well, then you must have an awful good reason. I bet you're trying to tie it in with that other murder. All right, Lieutenant. Don't tell me. I'll get my story somehow. Oh, if you want to know how things turn out, read the Chronicle in the morning. That's right. Now get in touch with Charlie in Mobile One and have him call for me here. Okay, honey. Won't you come up with anything? No, we're just briefing Barbara here. It's just amazing the way you've been able to put these things together. Don't kid yourself, Miss, uh, Mrs. Randall. It seems the press knows as much about it as we do. Well, let's hope they don't come to the same conclusions. A few lurid headlines and every fool in the country will be seeing phantoms in space suits and men from Mars all over the place. Yes, I can imagine. And mass hysteria is difficult to check once it gets started. That's why we've got to move fast. Well, from the looks of things, I guess it's up to me. I'll be in touch with you as soon as I hear anything. By 12.30 a.m., the dragnet was in operation. Mobile units patrolled the streets and countryside. They covered an area 35 miles square. Special and sensitive equipment was prepared for action. Everyone on the job was ready to move on the first signal from the Communications Commission. Monitor Corona the Mobile Center, Strength 4. Brickyard at 160th, moving toward oil fields. Contact your units, over and out. Units one and seven from Mobile Center. Units one and seven from Mobile Center. Strength four, interference at 160th in the oil field. Moving due east, close in. Repeating, strength four, interference at 160th in the oil field. Close in. Here, Joe. 
Just got here, trying to set this up. What gives, Hazen? It's in this area, all right. I thought the Geiger counter. Thank you, Doctor. Quite a walk over those oil fields. Well, it doesn't register as far as the oil fields. I think we'll do better if we split up. Man. Right, Lieutenant. You two go that way, Lieutenant, out here. Vince. Joe, you follow him. Come on, Doctor. And you? Oh, forget it. He went out of the window. We won't get very far. Don't touch anything till we check for fingerprints. Oh, doctor. Over here. He left his suit in his helmet. Hey, let's spread that thing out so I can get a good shot of it. Get right? away, you fool. What's the matter? For your information, that's a Geiger counter, and it says hands off. I think you'd better wait outside. I just have a job to do. So do we. And I'm afraid ours will have to come first. Now, there's no radiation from the helmet. But look at this. So that's what's been causing all the trouble. Charlie, you know where we can pick up a lead-lined box in a hurry? Well, Mobile 7 should have one. They're right outside. I'll take a look. Hurry it up, will you? Unbelievable. Now, we all thought that this phantom might be carrying some device which was causing all the signal interference. But we'll learn that it's due to the very clothes on his body. Well, that's not the only thing that bothers me. Did any of you get a good look at his face? <laughs> not me. He's too far away. Well, I did. Unless I'm mistaken, that helmet was empty. Hey, where am I going to put this stuff? Oh, put it in Dr. Wyatt's station. Yeah, we take it back to the Institute. Right. Come on, Anzi. 
No, that's all right. You can handle that. Any luck? Not a sign of him. The boys are still searching the grounds. <laughs> For what? Nobody knows what he looks like without that outfit. No bell on that, Major. The reporter got a flash picture of him, and I just happened to borrow that film. It's on its way to headquarters right now to be developed. Good. Send us a print as soon as you can. Sure. Lieutenant, are you sure you don't want to come with us? We want to make a few tests at the lab. I'd like to, Doctor. Would you know the situation? I've got to get that guy. Let me know how you make out, will you? Yeah, we'll do that. Sure. saw you drive in. Good evening, Barbara. Hello, Hello Bill. I see we got here just in time. Anything new? Lots of excitement, but that's all. Major, you know Barbara's husband? Oh, of course. How are you? How are you? Hey, it's a nice looking dog you've got there. What's his name? His name? Venus. Say, Bill, I hate to ask this, but something important has come up, and I wonder, can we borrow Barbara for about an hour or so? I suppose so. Uh, of course. Darling, why don't you go and do the shopping? Here's the list. The market's open all evening. <laughs> I may as well. See you later, darling. I'll take the dog and tie her up. Thank you, Bill. Good night. Good night. I'll give you a hand with it. Oh, thanks, Doc. Easy now. Look out for your fingers. All right. Fingerprints anywhere. What's all this? Hey, don't touch anything. You better put some gloves on. Our friend, Mr. X, left this suit at the oil refinery. You mean you were that close to him and you didn't catch him? I'm afraid so. That's up to the police now. Hand me those shears. I want to cut up this, this material to work with it. Hey, you better have those sharpened. But I just bought them. All right. Here, try this knife. That still won't cut. Let me try. This stuff is tougher than nylon. Why don't I try it over a Bunsen burner? Hmm. 
doesn't burn either. Let's take a look at it under the microscope. Look, it's, it's magnetic. Magnetic? You're Radioactive. Right. And apparently indestructible. Thank you. Tell me. Take a look at that weed. What weed? There is none. This material is one solid mass. Mass, yes. Well, you're right. It must be some sort of plastic. No. Well, I'd say it's a metallic substance of some kind. Well, I've seen a lot of interesting alloys, but never anything like this. Let's try an acid test. All right. Go ahead. Careful now. We'll only take a drop or two. It repels acid like a raincoat repels water. Why, there's no reaction. Well, Major, this looks as though we were going to be here for a long time. The helmet is not radioactive. The suit is. There is no doubt. This spacesuit is conditioned to function above 63,000 feet. The human blood would boil, resulting in the body expanding to twice its size. And death, of course. I know. And it must withstand pressure and counterpressure. Also, it must be so supercharged it can function in thin atmosphere. Now, let's see what it is that is left in this breathing apparatus. Well, how are you doing? The gas in the helmet tank breaks down to 11% methane. Ordinary marsh gas? What's the rest of the formula? Oh, that's where I'm stuck. I can't figure it out. It just doesn't respond to any of the usual tests. Well, how could anyone exist on that combination of gases? You and I couldn't. But apparently someone can. Oh. Doctor, are you trying to say that our X-man doesn't breathe oxygen? And hasn't the metabolism of a normal human? I really don't know. From what we've seen, he has some physical characteristics which make him appear human. But added to them is this fabulous radioactivity that none of us could stand. I am puzzled. I think the answer lies right here in this helmet. Obviously, he needs it to survive. Otherwise, he wouldn't have risked wearing it where he was sure to be recognized. As it is, he only took it off when he was cornered. Well, if what you say is true, how can he exist without it now? Let me put it this way. It's like a patient in an iron lung. Sometimes one can, can be removed for hours at a time without any ill effects. Exactly. And I think the same principle applies here. And that means, sooner or later, he has to get his breathing apparatus back or die. I don't understand. Well, I've got an idea. If we were to return this whole outfit to where he left it, he might be tempted to come back. Dr. Wyatt speaking. Yes, he's here. No, thank you. Hello, Major. Still at it, huh? Mm-hmm. No, we haven't got a thing, no. The picture? Yeah, hold on. He says the picture the reporter took of our man didn't come out. I was afraid of something like that. The radioactivity must have burned the emulsion. Hello. No. No, we didn't find any fingerprints at all in this clothes. Did you find any? Not too bad. Hello? Will you wait there, please? <laughs> we don't know what to make of this either. Have you heard from the communication boys yet? Well, let's hope they turn up with something. Major. Excuse me. Hold on a second. Yes? It's Mr. Wakeman of the Chronicle. He insists upon seeing you. 
He does? Where is he? I told him to wait in the lobby. Good. Hello? Yes, our friend from the press is here. Don't worry, I wouldn't dare let anyone in on anything. At least not till we get something concrete. Right. All right, I'll see you later. Well, I guess I'd better see this newspaper man. Want to come along, Doctor? I think I will. Oh, <laughs> hello. Remember me? Certainly, yes. A nice lot of gadgets you got here. We think so. What's on your mind? Well, I was wondering if you might let me take a couple of pictures of that suit you brought up here. I'm sorry, we can't do that. Oh. Well, now look, I got a wonderful picture of the guy running in the shack, and the lieutenant stuck his nose in my business, and what do I get? A blank. say we were curious. Hello, Bill. Are back so soon? Isn't Barbara through? I don't know. Uh, she's still in the lab. Why don't you go up and see? Thanks, I will. Barbara! Barbara, are you in there? Bill, listen to me. I'm not alone. Someone is in here with me. I can't see him. He locked the door and has the key. I'll break the door down. No, Bill, don't, please. You better get help. You mean I've come all the way up here for nothing? I'm afraid so. Good night. Yes, good night, Mr. Wakeman. Good night. Where's Barbara? In the lab. The door's locked and there's someone in there with her. I thought you said the door was locked. It was. She's gone. Oh, cover the main entrance. That's the only way anybody could leave. I will. Well, in that case, we would have seen her on our way up. Well, then she must still be in the building. We'd better split up. I'll take the roof.
Not up there. Where's the doctor? He went down to the basement. Here he comes. You didn't find her? No. I'd better call the police. But there's no telling what could happen to her in the meantime. No, no, take it easy. We're doing the best we can. But she said she was locked in. And she couldn't see who did it. Can you explain that? No. Not yet. from Mobile One, come in, please. This is Mobile Center. Go ahead. Get hold of Major Andrews or Dr. Wyatt at the Institute. I want to talk to either one of them. I will do. Stand by, Mobile One. Dr. Wyatt speaking. Oh, yes, Mr. Hazen. Yes, we're still at it. Uh, lots and lots of excitement, but nothing definite yet. Have you anything to say? The trouble seems to be just about gone. We get a flash in the direction of the observatory once in a while, but I figure that's because of the outfit you're testing. Yes. Lieutenant Bowers ought to be here any minute. Of course. How long will it take you to get up here? 
Good. See you then. Thank you, gentlemen. Put it down here, please. Barbara, bring that cord in over there. Now you're going to see... I have to resort to ultraviolet light in order to show you what little there is left of the spacesuit. As you can see, it has reduced itself to this liquid and it is in an evaporating stage. The helmet is in the lab and still intact. This is amazing. All the radiation in this suit would, why, it'd be fatal to a normal human being wearing it. Of course. And furthermore, our respiratory system could never simulate gases such as we have found in that breathing device. Well, then we have to assume our so-called X-man carried his own atmosphere with him. Excuse me. But as a matter of curiosity, why do we refer to this thing as a him? I thought it was invisible. Under normal conditions, yes. Yet, Mrs. Randall did see the imprint of a large foot and a masculine hand under ultraviolet light. How do you explain that? I don't know, but the human body is composed of various elements with a carbon base. I cool. Yes. Now, suppose we maintain the same chemical composition in the body of the X-Man but substitute silica for carbon. Silica, that's glass. Exactly. Now, it is possible that the body with such a base, if it were subjected to an atmosphere foreign to its origin, might appear invisible to our eyes. Are you trying to say, Doctor, that we're, we're not dealing with a human being? I didn't say that. On the contrary, all the evidence points in the opposite direction toward a superhuman with an intelligence far superior to our own. How can you tell? First of all, Mrs. Randall saw that he has a hand with digits like our own fingers and a thumb opposing. That alone is a sign of intelligence. And he comes from a civilization that has developed adequate space transportation to enable him to travel to Earth. We have nothing yet that can reach even another planet in our own solar system. That could account for the unidentified objects picked up by radar a few hours ago. My theory is that the spaceship, or whatever it was that he came in, operated on the principle of magnetic rather than atomic propulsion, and that somewhere in the outer limits met with the condition where the Earth's gravity pulled it down and it fell into the ocean, and that he managed to save his life and reach short. You really can pick up any type of communications interference, no matter how weak the signal may be. Sure thing. We were on his trail from the minute he left the beach. I never knew you carried such sensitive instruments in your car. What you told us is very interesting, Doctor. But I've got to make an official report to headquarters. Are you willing to be quoted that the criminal we're after is a creature from another world? All I can say is, we know that our Earth is not the only planet capable of sustaining life in one form or another. You can quote that. All I've got to go by is some footprints in a hand. That isn't much. No fingerprints, no description, no nothing. And, and we're after a killer. Has it occurred to you that our X-Man has no apparent motivation for his act? and might therefore not be an intentional criminal at all. You have a point there. Hey, wait a minute. Come to think of it, the young boarder we suspected, he did say that the girl's husband threw the first punch. So? So that could have been enough to provoke the strange creature. And the same could have happened at the second murder. Sure. But what about the fire in the oil fields? Evidently, our man sensed the presence of some gases, which he thought might be utilized in his breathing apparatus. Yeah, that could account for his presence at the oil refineries, where something went wrong, causing the explosion. Too bad he got wise to us and took off his uniform, or we'd have been able to catch up with him by now. No, he didn't utter a word. 
But I'm convinced he was trying to convey a message to me. He kept tapping out a code. I, I wrote it down. Let me see that, please. Doesn't make sense. Well, it may be based on some mathematical system we know nothing about. But he was trying to tell us something. Why did he run away? Think of that. Huh. Hazen must be crazy sending out stuff like that. I guess so. Let's try and get a hold of him. Yeah. Mobile One from Mobile Center. Come in, please. Mobile One from Mobile Center. Come in, please. Mobile One from Mobile Center. Come in, please. Hey, that's Central calling. You better stay here by the car. I'll go tell Hazen. Yes, Colonel Powell. Of course, I'll mail you a complete report first thing in the morning. Yes, sir, thank you. Oh, and I'm, I'm awfully sorry to disturb you so late at night. Right, good night, sir. He's around here, this invisible guy. He was in the car. How do you know? I was talking to Randall outside when I heard Central calling. Before I could get over to answer, I saw the door open and shut by itself. He's desperate. For all we know, he could be trying to send a distress signal to his home base, wherever that is. Well, let's hope he doesn't get through. We've got enough problems with just one of those guys. Well, at least we know he's around in the vicinity, and it's obvious what keeps him around. Of course, he's got to come back for what little gas there is left in his helmet. And when he does... Oh, please, the most important thing is to take him alive. If we can only make each other understand, there's no telling how much science can profit. I'll go along with that, Doctor. But I've got to make sure that once he's cornered, I'll be able to hang on to him. I think we're all agreed on that. All right, good, Ben. We must see it from his angle. He's in an alien world. No doubt we are as frightening to him as he is to us. Now, the most important thing, then, is to keep calm at all costs and do nothing to provoke him. Immediately, a simple plan to trap the Phantom went into operation. All obstacles to his entry were removed. To erase any possible suspicion, the doors were left unguarded and inconspicuous electric eye equipment was set up. All this was connected to a makeshift control board, which would immediately signal the exact location of the trespasser. Now, there was nothing to do but wait. The one road leading to the Institute was blocked off to make certain no outsider would upset the plans or interfere in any way. What's the big idea? Sorry, nobody's allowed through here. Who said so? Lieutenant Bower's orders. Oh, is he up there? He might be. Well, you get word to him that Joe Wakeman of the Chronicle is here. Sorry, bud, I can't leave. Oh, what about them over there? Hey, you over there. Me? Yeah. Aren't you the guy from the communications outfit? Didn't I see you down at the oil fields a couple hours ago? What of it? You got anything to do with this? Well, you'll have to ask Lieutenant Bowers about that. How can I if he won't see me? That's a good question. Time. Time is cheap. Yeah, well, how long can you sit on the edge of your chair like this? Over there if we have to. How do you hope this mechanism works? It will, unless he flies in between the wires. I wouldn't take any bets that he can't. Well, if everything else fails, we still have Venus here to help us. You know, I'm certain she sensed his presence before. That's why she carried on so. What's the matter, Lieutenant? Is this thing getting you? Oh, no, no. I'm just thinking about public reaction to all this. I'll give something to the press by morning.
You know, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. Then after I got my wings and had had 75 missions, I thought I'd seen everything. Now, after all this, I know I haven't seen anything. He's here. The back end. Let's cut him off. Remember, now, take it easy. Go back.
Take this. I'm going after you. The door. In here by the big telescope. chance. We have to take him alive. Plug in the lamps. There's an outlet here. sound is coming out of his mouth. Look at Venus. She acts as though she hears him. Yes. Dog can hear sounds that we can. His voice must be beyond the range of the human ear. Maybe he's screaming. He's suffocating. The glow, it's almost gone. lights anymore. In death, the ears become visible as a normal body.
show starts, let's enjoy an intermission. You'll find our snack bar chock full of good things to eat and drink. Tasty, tempting hot dogs, thirst-quenching soft drinks, fresh, crunchy popcorn, a complete assortment of delicious candy, and a full line of cigarettes. You've plenty of time, so visit the snack bar now. A tasty treat will double your enjoyment of the show. For your convenience, we shall keep you informed of the remaining intermission time. The next show will start in nine minutes. Now it's Pepsi for those who think young. Today, people have a thirst for fun in every season at every age. They're getting more out of life. This is Thinking Young. And this is the life for Pepsi. Light, bracing, clean-tasting Pepsi. Think Young. Say Pepsi, please. Soledad Platz, Nevada. The time, 6.15 a.m. Climax of arduous planning. Operation A bomb test underway. Detonation minus two minutes. Military personnel from Buck Private to top ranking brass. Men from research and news services move into position. The bomb carrying plane makes its initial run. that never sleep. Special equipment go into operation. All orders are carried out with split-second precision. Warning is given to all commercial aircraft to stay out of the test area. Detonation minus 70 seconds. Planes take to the air, carrying sensitive instruments and nuclear scientists ready to record the radioactivity from the closest possible vantage point. Detonation minus 40 seconds. The bomb-carrying plane nears the target. Tension mounts as all members of the flight crew anticipate the task to pinpoint the bomb on a tiny circle of Earth below. Now the plane wings its way toward ground zero. Warning signal is sounded. All observers prepare for the blinding flash of the bomb. Detonation minus 20 seconds. Command of the plane is given to the bombardier. Ground zero dead ahead. The key man now goes into action. Bomb bay doors open. Detonation minus 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And this is the beginning. We're circling ground zero at radius of 7.5 miles. Altitude one, five, zero, zero, zero feet. Airspeed four, five, zero. Stand by. Roger and over. She's all yours. This is Dr. Martin. Here are the readings. 0.378 negative, second indicator. 1.08 negative. Radiation point four. Over. Roger, proceed according to plan. We'll go and up. Take her 
in closer. Okay, Dr. Martin. Tar Baby 2. Come in, Tar Baby 2. We've lost contact, sir. Baker 2, sir. Yes, sir. All patrol craft in test area. This is a May Day. Repeat, this is a May Day. Proceed to segment Baker 17. Search for Tar Baby 2. Southwest corner, Soledad Flats. Ship appears completely demolished. No sign of survivors. Over. Roger, Tar Baby 7. Circle wreckage at 1000 feet until arrival of helicopter rescue unit. Dr. Kruger, Colonel Banks speaking. Would you mind coming into my office right away, please? Thank you. As I was saying, our search plane has found the wreckage of your husband's plane, Mrs. Martin. A rescue crew was sent out, but... But they must have reached the wreckage hours ago. Why can't they find him? I honestly don't know, Mrs. Martin. Yes, come in. not, Mrs. Martin. They found the pilot dead in the wreckage. And according to all reports, no one could have bailed out. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Martin. shows no indication of any scars on your body. Well, I must have got it in a crash. Uh, 
Now, this was surgery. A very skillful incision. I've never had an operation. Now, that's what I don't understand. Mr. Briggs. Colonel Bank. How are you, Mr. Briggs? Fine, how are you? Fine. I see the FBI doesn't waste much time. Well, uh, not if we can help it, Colonel. Oh, you know our base surgeon, Major Clift? Sure. How have you been, Major? How do you do? Uh, well, I guess you gentlemen have business to discuss. Oh, no, no. This won't take a minute. Sit down. <laughs> Sit down, please, please, gentlemen. Cigarette. Oh, thank you. I understand you've already talked with Dr. Martin. I just left him. You know, our Colonel, um, according to my files, Dr. Martin is just about the key man on this nuclear project. Yes, along with Dr. Kruger, he is. Mm -hmm. Well, I know they're both good friends and, uh, well, both have knowledge and access to top secret information. Well, that's very true, but there's no reason to suspect that oh, they... Oh, we can, uh, we can suspect anything, Colonel. Until Dr. Martin accounts for every minute from the time of the crash. The shock must have caused a mental block. His mind doesn't want to remember the details. The, the origin of the scar on his chest. How he got back to the base under his own power. Did you ever stop to think that perhaps this Dr. Martin isn't really the Dr. Martin? What are you getting at? What I mean is that uh, this man could be an imposter. They do check. That's what I've been waiting for. Thanks. Get me Colonel Banks at the base, please. No, no, I'll wait. Oh, yes, Mr. Briggs. Any news on the line you were getting on Dr. Martin? Just heard from Washington. Well, I was wrong. This is our man, all right. His prints and description check right down the line. Now, here's what I suggest you do. But you see, he's in excellent physical condition, yet you're keeping him in the base hospital. Why? Mrs. Martin, you must realize that your husband is engaged in a highly secret work. If this experience had, well, affected his mind... Are you trying to tell me that Doc is... No, no, no. It's nothing serious, Mrs. Martin. His reflexes are excellent. Except for that one lapse of memory, his mind is perfectly clear. Isn't that natural under the circumstances? Yes. Except for the question of the scar on his chest. I know he didn't have it before the crash. Well, I'm sure he didn't, Mrs. Martin. But you see, it would be impossible for a wound of this size to have healed so quickly and without medical attention. Well, you can't keep him here indefinitely. Well, we don't intend to. Uh, we asked you to come down here because we've decided to let you take him home. Provided you can keep him quiet and he gets in the breast. I understand. Now we'll just have to take that vacation he's been wanting for so long. Vacation? To watch him, you'd think you never heard of one. Yes, he must have asked me a hundred times when the next test was scheduled. He's anxious to take his own readings again. Well, he did have a key part in the planning of these projects. Well, is there anything he should or shouldn't be allowed to do? No. Except... He does need diversion. Anything that won't upset or excite him. I see. Movies, bridge, drives, things like that. Well, you're the doctor now. Just see that he gets plenty of rest. Thank you. Goodbye, Colonel. Goodbye. See you later, Major.
time is it? Well, after three. I'm going to get myself a glass of milk. Speaking. Sergeant Bandero. Anything I can do for you, Doctor? I wondered if there were any last minute orders on another atomic test. What do you mean you can't tell me? Sorry, sir. Regulations. I can't give out information to anyone. No, sir. It won't do you any good to come down. All right. We'll see about that. Don't you agree with me? I've spent months preparing for this series of tests, and no sergeant is going to push me around now. Well, aren't you going to say anything? No. Look, I know they're ready for another test, and I should be there. Can't you understand that they don't want you around for your own good? I don't need their sympathy. There's nothing wrong with me. Then why are you acting this way? You're all on edge. If you don't slow down, I don't know what's going to happen. You really believe that, don't you? If you won't take it easy for your own sake, please, do it for mine. state you're not considered a very good security risk me a security risk my present state what's the matter with me how long am i to be considered only temporarily the results of the test will be available for your study when you return to work i am ready colonel to us you're still a very sick man my advice to you is to go home and relax as you were ordered relax relax and if i don't then you'll be confined to the base hospital till you change your mind now what's it going to be Well, Doctor? Oh, Dr. Martin. I didn't expect you back so soon. Well, haven't you heard? I'm a metal case. Can't even be trusted with my own work. Ah! I'm going to go berserk at any minute. Colonel Banks will fill you in on the details. Now, don't, don't tell me. Let me see. You're, uh... I know, I know. You're Miss uh, Vincent, the secretary I share with, uh... Oh, mm. Doctor, you can't be serious. Uh, there was no one in your office, so I thought you wouldn't mind. Oh, that's all right. It's all right. As far as I'm concerned, you can take the rest of the day off. Are you sure? Mm hmm No, oh, I don't really belong here. I just, uh, just came in to pick up a few personal things from my desk. Goodbye. Goodbye.
Dr. Kruger's office. Give me Colonel Banks at the officers' club. Thank you, Doctor. Good night. Good evening, Dr. Kruger. Yes. My name's Briggs. I'm from the FBI. Briggs. Briggs. Of course. I've heard of you. <laughs> I wonder if you'd mind uh, returning to your office with me. Well, what seems to be the trouble? Oh, just a few things we'd like to straighten out. Concerns me? Well, I'm afraid so, Doctor. And take your own car, if you like. I'll meet you there. All right, I will. The papers seem to be intact. Is this all uh, classified information, Doctor? Of course. You know, according to security regulations, that vault should have been locked before you left. But I'm certain I did lock it. All right, then tell me this. Who besides yourself has access to the combination? Well, the Colonel here and Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin. Huh? He was in the building this afternoon. That's right. We saw him in my office. He left around 4 o'clock on orders. He dismissed the secretary a few minutes later, but he... He didn't sign out of here until 20 minutes after you left. After I did? Well, there must be some mistake. I personally checked his office just as I was leaving, and he wasn't there. Do you always do that, Doctor? No, but Dr. Martin has been acting, well, quite strange of late. Yes, he certainly has. His wife telephoned to say that he hadn't come home as usual. I was very much concerned about it. So am I. He still hasn't shown up yet. What kind of pipe tobacco do you use, Dr. Kruger? Me? Why, I don't smoke at all. Did you, Colonel? Cigarettes. What are you oh. driving at? That's funny. How long has Dr. Martin been using this brand of tobacco? Well, I really don't know. Why? Well, now, Mrs. Martin, you say you have no idea where he could be at this hour. Well, I know he's never been this late before without telephoning. 
Well, I hate to ask this, but have you ever had any suspicion that there might be another woman? Certainly not. I'm sorry, Miss Morton. Just why are you asking me these questions? Well, let's put it this way. Has he made any new friends lately? You know, people not in the usual group. No, the only people we've seen in months have been connected with the Institute. Excuse me. Hello? Yes, just a moment. It's for you, Mr. Briggs. Oh, thank you. All units in Sector 7, Code 4. Repeating, Code 4. Be on the lookout for two-tone coupe. License number 1W67713. Repeating, all units, code 4, missing. Dr. Douglas P. as in Paul Martin, male Caucasian, 32 years of age, height 6 foot 3, weight 195 pounds, color of hair blonde, color of eyes blue. Last seen driving coupe. License number 1W67713. doing with this? Any special reason for placing it under this rock? Your pump. Over there behind the pump. Operator, give me Crestview 95359. All units in Sector 7, Code 4. Repeating, Code 4. Be on lookout for two tone coupe. License number 1W67713. Operator, are you sure you're dialing the right number? We'll try it again, will you? It's my home. There ought to be someone there now. At junction of Highway 66 and Beach, ambulance en route. Car 17, Code 7, fourth and robbery. Suspects may be armed. Repeating, Code 2 to all units. Dr. Douglas P. as in Paul Martin, male Caucasian, 32 years of age, height 6 foot 3, weight 195 pounds, color of hair blonde, color of eyes blue, missing. Dr. Douglas P. as in Paul Martin, male Caucasian, repeating, goes through to all you. Hey, mister! Give me the police, quick. Central. Hello, Central. This is Briggs. This is Briggs. Come in. Subject, Dr. Douglas Martin, last seen in Route 61, heading toward North Junction. Stopped at gas station corner of Ridgewood and Mills Road. Acknowledge. Roger. Briggs, out.
they're gonna here. They're here, they're here, they're going to destroy us. He's coming out of it. It's all right, Dr. Martin. You're with friends. You'll be all right. Now let me go. Let me go. That ain't our study, Doc. He'll kill everyone. We've got to stop now. Easy, Doug. Easy. I guess you'll make sense now. I'll get the recorder ready. Can you hear me, Dr. Martin? Yes. Now listen to me. I want you to count backwards from 100. Do you understand? Backwards from 100. 100. 99. now. Dr. Martin, what were you doing with the information you took from Dr. Kruger's vault? I was delivering it. Delivering it? But where? To the rocks in Soledad Flats? Yes. To Soledad Flats. And where we crashed. I was delivering it, just as I was ordered. Who ordered you to do this, Dr. Martin? I'll tell you the whole story. I remember we were circling the atomic cloud. So there was an object blowing beneath us at Soledad Flats. We were going down to investigate. Controls jammed. Couldn't pull out. When I regained consciousness, I was on a table. Next thing I knew, they were coming at me. Strange people. Their eyes, uh, those horrible eyes. They didn't speak. I, I could see something strange and eerie pulsating in front of me. Then one of them lowered it toward my chest. It was my own heart. What happened? What is this place? Who are you? What are you doing to me? Can't you speak? Who are you? well. You have recovered from your unfortunate accident. Who are you? A scientist like yourself. Where do you come from? From a planet yet unknown to you. You know my name. You speak English. We speak every language. You can't expect me to believe that. I'm getting out of here. Stay where you are.
Who are you? I have already told you that. How did you get here? Here. In our machine, magnetically propelled across the electron bridge we have created. Electron bridge? You mean you come and go, just like that? Without anyone ever seeing you? Our ships have been sighted on numerous occasions by your people. Then why haven't we been able to track one down? We have a warning system similar to your primitive radar. Our machines are set to change course at the mere approach of a pursuing object. Let's say I do believe you. Where are we right now? In a cavern within the upper crust of the Earth. How long have we been here? Since the beginning of your experiments in nuclear fission. What have you got to do with that? We are accumulating the energy released with each of your atomic explosions. One moment. No, I hear it. Hear it. No, we don't. Hear it. I let it. No, I don't. Yeah, you know. What was that? A report from the monitor we sent to the surface to obtain the results of your last nuclear test. Results? They'll take days to analyze and compute. I think you will find these figures are correct. I can't believe it. Where is that man? You don't recognize the area? No. He is in the vicinity where you crashed. That rock was glowing. A normal reaction in view of the amount of radiation absorbed. You have a remarkable memory, Doctor considering the fact that you did not survive the crash. What do you mean? The mechanism of your heart had ceased to function. It was necessary for us to revive it. You were dead. I was dead? So that's what they were doing. You didn't even try to help the pilot. Why did you save me? Because we had an important need of your services. Such as? Look this way, Doctor. You will understand. Here, Doctor. You are the first of your world to be looking at our solar system, the Astron. This is our planet, Astron Delta. It occupies the fourth position in relation to this, our sun. Yes, go on. During the 23rd time rotation, our sun began to die. So during the succeeding generations, as our planet began to cool, vegetation began to disappear. Our eyes developed to this state to combat the ever-growing darkness. We were forced to migrate. You left your planet? Where? We invaded these neighboring planets. They were nearer to our sun. attempts to stop us, but 
we were prepared for such contingencies. And now that our sun is about to completely expire, we must move again in order to survive. Yours is the only planet in this solar system capable of supporting our civilization. This is fantastic. Over a billion of you trying to come here to Earth. We have no alternative. We have been putting our plan to work for some time. At the proper moment, the invasion will be launched from our platforms, which are being readied in space. Nothing can stop us. Insane. This is ridiculous. You cannot find your way in or out of this cavern. Do not try to leave.
you have discovered our menagerie. Don't you think you will be more at ease on this side of the cage? It's horrible. What are you doing here? We are breeding our, shall I say, armies. Those carnivorous insects and animals? Look at them. Their growth is due to a change in their genes. With your next nuclear test, these animals will multiply at a rate beyond imagination. When the time comes, we will unleash them. They will spread to every continent and devour every living thing on the surface of the Earth. What good will that do you? How could you expect to survive better than we? We have provided for that. No, Doctor. Look over there. We will use their bodies to fertilize the soil. Vegetation will rise up in abundance. A new era of civilization will begin. Gamma rays? You see, Doctor. We have arranged for everything. Wait a minute. All this equipment? Our nuclear storage units. To date, we have accumulated several billion electron volts as a result of your atomic explosions. Several billion? I have... A chain reaction at this point could release enough unstable isotopes to, to create a new and powerful element. Might be impossible to control. True. An element that will never be known by your scientists. I can assure you the strength of this new element will... And this is a powder cake. Could go up in any minute. I assure you, Doctor, we have everything under our complete control. What force could possibly be strong enough to harness the... You control your whole operation by electricity. Of course, no generators, no generators. That means you're getting your power from somewhere on the surface. It must be passing through here. You have heard enough, Dr. Martin. Step inside. All right. What do you want from me? You will have access to advanced information relative to the time and strength of the forthcoming atomic tests. What about it? He will provide us with that information as soon as it is available. I see. You're afraid of an overload. You can't tap enough electricity wherever you get it from to control a strong enough charge. You are a clever man, Doctor. Perhaps too clever. And what makes you think I'll give you any information? It is the only way you can save your own life when the time comes. You will be transported to one of our platforms in space and resettled here when our operation is completed. You're asking me to sabotage the entire world, three billion people. They are doomed in any case. Well, I guess there's no alternative. I'll have to do as you say. You are lying, Doctor. Your only wish is to betray us. No. I know. Your thoughts have been recorded. Lie detective? Call it what you like. You force me to resort to other methods. I will contact our space station. You are an unwilling subject, Dr. Martin. What? Who are you? I am Vitara. You will listen and obey. No, I... You will listen to my orders and obey. You will listen and obey. Listen and obey. You will remember nothing you have seen or heard here. 
nothing but my orders which you will obey. Yes. You will obtain the data and bring it to the stone near the place where your plane was wrecked. To the stone. What have you seen or heard here? What have you seen or heard here? Nothing. Repeat my orders. I will obtain the data and bring it to the stone. Well, that's what I did. I took the information to where they told me. I didn't realize I was being mesmerized. Why doesn't somebody say something? Don't you believe me? Kurt, you understand. These giant animals breeding by the millions, they'll devour everything unless we stop them. Of course, Doug, we will. Colonel. Colonel, you've got to arrange to set off another bomb tonight. The strongest charge we have. They're beneath the ground with all their equipment. We can blow them to pieces. Now, wait a minute. A strong charge will overload their units. You don't believe me, Colonel? Major? Kurt? Of course we do. Easy, Doug. Easy. You think I'm crazy, all of you. Well, I'm not. Do you understand? Everything I said is true. I saw it with my own eyes. Give me a hand, Doug. Now, let me go. Let me go. Steady, steady, steady. Take it easy now. Take it easy. We'll talk this whole thing over. What are you doing to me now? And just rest quietly. That's it. Mrs. Martin should be along any minute now. She went for their car. What'll I tell her? Well, he's in a state of shock. Tell her he's resting quietly. Well, excuse me, I think I'd better wait for her at the information desk. Well, Dr. Martin seems to be indestructible, except for those hallucinations. Those weren't hallucinations, Colonel. Under the influence of sodium amytol, a patient loses all control of his imagination. Well, then he shouldn't be able to fabricate those stories. That's right. Major, you're not trying to tell us that everything he said was true. Look, gentlemen, I can only give you the medical facts. As for the rest, you'll have to decide for yourself. Excuse me, please. Dr. Kroger. Chilly, isn't it? Oh, Mr. Briggs, you startled me. I didn't expect to see anyone here. Well, uh, neither did I, Doctor. Well, I suppose you want me to explain why I'm here. Mm-hmm. I want to believe, Doug. We've worked together a long time. Anyway, I just had to come out here and check for myself. Check what, Doctor? For an entrance or an exit to the caverns he described. I'm afraid you're wasting your time. A cigarette, Doctor? No, thank you. See, we've already covered the entire area. We couldn't find a thing. Then, what about that scar? I'd like to see you disprove that. Oh, Mrs. Martin. Oh. How is he, Doctor? Oh, he's resting fine. I think he'll be all right. How's the car?
go. They're after me. Nobody's after you, Dr. Martin. Keep away. Look, he's trying to help you. I don't need the help. I, I want to see Kurt right away. Now you control yourself. And I'll call him just as soon as you get back to your room. Get back into bed and I'll call Dr. Kruger. Uh, I've got to figure something out before he gets here. I need a pencil, some paper, and a slide rule. I'll see that you get it. Oh, can I have Dr. Kruger, please? Dr. Kruger speaking. Oh, yes, Major. How is he? All right, I'll be over in a few minutes. Doug. Doug. I could. Is there anything wrong? He's much better. Imagine he's even started working. He asked for paper and a slide rule. That's interesting. Wonder what he's up to. Formulas, equations. Anyway, whatever he says, pretend to agree with him. Major Cliff's orders. Of course. Doug. Doug Kurt's here. Hello, Doug. In just a second. I'm almost finished. I'll take your hat. Thank you. Kurt, let's face it. I know that you all think there's something wrong with me. No, of course not. No, I, I wouldn't blame you after the story I told last night. Well, frankly, you did have us a little worried asking that the bomb be dropped because of what you said. You don't believe me either. Kurt, I tell you, I've been there. I've seen what they're doing, breeding animals into carnivorous monsters. But I don't need a bomb to stop them. I figured it out. It's all here. Now, look. Here's the nuclear strength of our last test. And this is the amount of electricity needed to control it. Let me see that. I had to estimate the conversion rates of their transformers. These figures are correct. Such transformers must operate on a constant supply of electricity. Where could they get that much electric power? Only one way. They must tap it from the main lines at the powerhouse. Could do it by parallel induction. Nobody would ever know the difference. All we have to do is to cut it off. Cut off the power? We can't do that. It would cause untold damage for miles around. Such a power stoppage must be planned in advance. Eight to ten seconds, that's all I need. That gap in supply will short out their resistors and the whole thing will go up. But you won't go along with that. No, no, not you. Doug, get back in bed. Now look, you're carrying this out of our way. Doug! Please call the main gate and try to stop Dr. Martin. Doug, stop the car. Hurry. Dr. Martin. Stop. Stop. He did what? How long ago? Right, we'll leave immediately. What's wrong, Colonel? Dr. Martin. He's on his way to the powerhouse, wants to cut off the power supply. Let's go. I couldn't stop him, Doctor. He went that way.
car. It went into the building. Folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. 
Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.